Good afternoon. And on behalf of the family of Jeff Kao, I want to thank you for coming to remember and celebrate his life. He was a devoted husband, father, grandfather, a beloved teacher and mentor. He was also a loyal friend and a kind and compassionate, gentle giant who made this world a better place. Jeff was the head of our elder of this church from 2009 to 2012, and it was my privilege to work with him during that time. He loved this church and this community. At this time, I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, we come to you with thankfulness in our hearts for the dedicated life of Jeff Kale. I pray that you will be with Donna, Chris, and Kurt and their families and give them comfort and peace. We're thankful for the difference that Jeff made in our community and in our lives. And so we pray that you will be present with us as we honor and celebrate his life. In Jesus' name, amen.
Welcome to Ukeo Men. Uh, all my life, I've been the shortest one. The Marky, just take your time. All right, thank you very much. Um, it's like this. I got a call saying that my brother had passed, and a little bit while later, I got a message from little Kurt that he wanted the birth dates and birthplaces of my parents. So I said, sure. I picked up my phone to call Jeff. So that's how it is. Things are different now. We have three generations of KO men and their precious, precious, priceless families and relatives. Uh, and we'd like to welcome you today on a very, very personal level. Um, we're going to try and talk about some of the things that Jeff meant to us uh, because we know, based on the comments on the internet that have come back, how much he meant to your community. Um, clearly, clearly obvious. So I want to thank you for the comments and I want to thank Loma Linda. Uh, for giving Jeff um, a place to grow and a place to serve. And that's how we feel about it. I'm going to tell you a story here, um, and then I'm going to, we're all going to have something to say, maybe. Most Friday nights, Jeff and I would talk. We would call, and he would always forget to call. And I don't know if he forgot things with you, but... He just was laid back and we would talk. We talked about three things. We talked about theology in everyday life. We talked about worse, uh, work versus retirement because I'm retired and he kept trying, so he said, to retire. Uh, and the third thing was family. How in love he was with Donna which I, you guys, you still make me blush when you talk about your relationship with Jeff. I, um, and he would talk about his boys. And I would tell you, I still hate being the shortest KO. I would tell you how much he loved them and how much they meant to him. Um, there was a fourth thing we talked about and that was politics. And then we would just laugh. <laughs> You couldn't talk about it. We were sailing boats when we were boys at uh, Beverly Hills Park. He was eight and I was six. Some boys his age came along, shoved me down, and took my boat. So my big brother came over and shoved them down, chased them away, and got my boat. That's my hero. Um, Jeff was very old school. When he was 10 and I was eight, we were living in Panorama City and there was a lot of vacant lots around in those days. So we would go hiking through the vacant lots looking for snakes and lizards and horny toads. So Jeff caught a lizard. And who but a future pathologist would lay it on a rock and say, I wonder what's inside. <laughs> That is exactly what happened, and you know what happened next. Uh, I'm a witness, but I was not involved, okay? <laughs> um, I'm going to pass this on here, telling this is something that relates to you folks. I asked Jeff once, since he seemed to be constantly climbing up his profession's pathological ladder, as I call it. And I said, what is it? Do you want to be in charge one day? And he said, no. When they want me to take on something I don't want to do, I just mess up and they leave me alone. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if that's, but that's what he said, so I'm taking him at his word. Um, My brother was, he made life better 
kinder and easier for all of us, as you all know. And I would like to turn this over to some of the other witnesses. And on behalf of the family, again, I want to say thank you for joining us and for all the comments you've made online and stories you've shared. Um, we thought we knew our father, but through your messages, we've really seen a different side to this quiet man who didn't really talk about himself very much. So what was Jeff Kao like as a father? Well, I think he's a lot like you might imagine for those of you that knew him. He was incredibly patient and kind. In fact, I was thinking back, I couldn't think of a single time, no exaggeration, that he actually lost his temper when we were children. And I don't think my kids could say the same thing about me, but that's a pretty incredible feat, especially when you consider my brother and I and our loving mother. I said if he was Catholic, he'd probably be up for sainthood at this point. He probably didn't always get the respect he deserved at, at home. I remember one time I uh, stepped on a rusty nail and I needed a tetanus shot. So my dad brought one home from the hospital and he was coming towards me with the needle. And I fell on the floor and started yelling and grabbed his leg and I said, I want a real doctor, not a pathologist. <laughs> he was an unassuming and unpretentious man. He enjoyed the simple things in life. I think you all knew that. He loved working hard and being productive. He loved eating a good meal, sipping on a cold Diet Coke, of course, and of course taking his famous 10-minute naps. I don't know if you remember that. He could nap anywhere at any time in just about any position. And the most amazing part is he could wake up 10 minutes later refreshed and ready to go. I don't think I could pull that off. He didn't wear fancy clothes. He dressed for comfort and function, more like a studious professor than like a physician. He lived in a modest, comfortable house, and he drove a modest car. In fact, I sometimes wonder if he took secret pride in driving, uh, I wouldn't say the worst car he could get his hands on, but definitely not your typical physician's car. I don't know if any of you remember the 1970-something VW bus he used to drive around in. Yeah. The best way to describe the color is that it had been yellow at one point in the past. It had four gears and a top speed of about 50 miles an hour, and going downhill helped. He'd driven it around the Midwest, so you could actually see the road flying by through the floorboards. And I can just imagine him pulling into the doctor's parking lot in that thing and parking between a BMW and a Mercedes with a smile on his face. Growing up, though, I thought that VW bus was the coolest thing in the world. I thought it was like a rocket ship. And it was because of him and the way he made me feel. I have a picture of me standing on the passenger seat and hanging on to the dashboard handlebar as we were driving around the neighborhood or going off-roading. Yes, you can off-road in a VW bus, apparently. <laughs> going through the deserts. You know, and, and if you're, in case you're wondering about seat belts, it's a VW bus. Uh, the engine's in the back, so there's about two pieces of tinfoil between you and oblivion in the front anyway, so and it wouldn't have made a difference. But he would take the center seat out, he'd put mattresses in, load it full of kids, the Souser boys and us, take us camping, take us on Pathfinder camperies, and we had the best time. I thought that car was the coolest thing in the world until it became my first car in high school. <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't think it was so cool then. My dad was a dedicated and loyal person. He was dedicated to his work and to Loma Linda, to his students and to his church, and to my mother. He stood by her side for nearly 50 years, including 20 years of battling Parkinson's. Many of you probably remember him bringing her to church and uh, you know, never fail to get her up here in the front row no matter the effort, but what you didn't see is what he did behind the scenes. He'd work all day and then take care of her all night. His health suffered and he was exhausted, and by the end he lost almost seven inches of height. He was shorter than me. But I'll tell you one thing, my dad never complained, and he would not discuss other options for my mother. It was his duty and privilege to care for her and he did it willingly. And after my mom passed away, 
and an appropriate amount of time passed. <laughs> he met a new love and companion in Donna Carlson, and he stood by her side for, through thick and thin, and they enjoyed many happy years together, which I'm very thankful for. Our father fell ill quite suddenly and spent a week in the hospital fighting as hard as he could to get home to Donna. Things didn't go as we planned, and on his last day, he was actually looking a little better. I was able to sneak my kids in, and they saw him for just a second. He squeezed their hand and smiled. But late in the morning, he took a turn for the worse, and despite all efforts, we began to realize there wasn't much else we could do, and time was short. So Donna cuddled up next to him on one side, and I knelt down by his side on the other, and I reached my arm around him, and I held him. And Dr. Lauren Tan, who'd taken care of him that entire week, day and night, took a moment to read a, a scripture, which I think was perfect. It comes from 2 Timothy. I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only me, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. Mm -hmm. Our father fought the good fight, and he kept the faith till the end. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's indeed an honor to be here and talk about my great friend Jeff. But before I do that, I was wondering, how many of you have ever been his students? Could, could you stand up? I'd just be, just be happy to, I'd, I'd really be happy to see. That's great, that's great. Okay, thank you. Well, it's an honor to talk about Jeff. I've known Jeff for 50 years. We went, we went to school together and uh, in medical school, and I remember seeing him for the first time. We were all little short guys sitting around there, and this giant of a fellow came in, and uh, we all looked up at him, and we couldn't believe. I think he was six foot seven or something like that. He was he was really tall. I said, "Wow." One of the problems we had, though, we couldn't sit behind him in a lecture hall because it, the lecture hall there would be all these seats lined up all the way down. You have to sit three rows back to see over his head, so you can see the see the professor and the and the slides and everything else. So we all, there was always a vacancy behind behind Jeff, but that was okay. Um, we called him the gentle giant. I think you've talked about that before. Uh, he, you know, looked down upon everybody, but he never really looked down upon anybody. Literally, he was. He was a man of, of uh, hum humility, and I never saw him treat anyone bad in my entire existence. I've never heard him say a crossword. And I remember he used to see the janitors and walk by them, and he'd stop and talk to them. Didn't matter what phase of life you were in or what you did, Jeff treated you with great, great, great respect. Um, he was always serious about studying, and I remember him when he was a junior uh, medical student on the ward, uh, he would teach the nurses. The nurses would, wouldn't understand something and he would sit with them, even if it was 12 at night or one in the morning. And uh, when he became a senior medical student, he would help and talk and teach the, uh, the junior medical students. So he always took the time to, to, to do that. So I thought to myself, said, Jeff could really be a great teacher someday. I, mean, I look, look at what he's done just as a medical student. Of course, we didn't know that at the time. Jeff was an organizer. Even back in medical school, he used to get all our classmates together and we'd have a game night or we, he would take us 
out to Joshua Tree. We'd all get together, and he was the one that all organized that, and that ability stuck with him th throughout the years. He had a dry sense of humor, too. That's one thing I liked about Jeff. And uh, I remember one time he used to drive these vans, and uh, one time his van stalled out, and he, he said, you know, you never call the automobile club when your van stalls out. He said, you call an artist. I said, what, what, do you, what do you mean by that? He said, well, they know how to make a van go. <laughs> but also, you have to pay a lot of Monet. <laughs> so um, he also played in the basketball. I was talking to George Grames, and he said he played with us in the faculty. And uh, as I'd watch him dribble down the court, I said, you know, this guy could be a urologist. He really could. <laughs> but fa fast forwarding, fast forwarding, he went to Kettering and he took an internship and, and somehow he got interested in pathology. I was a little disappointed. Those long fingers would be great for urology. <laughs> so he joined the faculty after Kettering. He came back and joined the faculty. And he started doing some teaching in the, in the uh, pathology department. And as he did this, the teachers really, uh, the, the students really looked at him and said, this guy can really explain things in pathology. This is amazing. So he became the uh, professor in charge of all the pathology for the teaching of the students. And um, they just admired him. It was nothing like it. I know because I taught urology, the urology section for pathology for 20 years with Jeff. And I, when I would finish, and when he would finish a lecture, he didn't just disappear into the archives of the university. He went to the front of the classroom and the students would come up and ask him questions. And he was never too busy to do that. He uh, would listen to them, he would sympathize with them. He'd put his arm around them and he would encourage them. You can't put a price on that. So because of this, and because of his impact upon all the students, he was named the Teacher of the Year many, many years. The student adored him. One of the things that, that happened that really impressed upon me is when he developed a lymphoma, some of the students shaved their heads in honor of him and to, to support him. I thought that was amazing. Years later, he organized, he was the organizer of our class reunions. So for 50 years, he'd make sure at the APC time that we'd all get together and he would organize that. I don't know what's going to happen to us now because he was such a fantastic organizer. We all wanted to get together. So what do you say about a teacher, a colleague? What do you say about your best friend? I think Jeff had the person, the, the purpose-driven life. I think God came along in his life and impressed him to do what he did because he did it so well. He didn't want accolades. He wanted his students to learn to be the best doctors that they could. And when he'd see the light of learning come on in their eyes, that was his reward. He was bigger than life. He was a man that respected everybody. He was not boastful. He was humble. And as already has been said, Paul said it so good in 2 Timothy, I've fought the good fight, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. So Jeff, we all loved you as a classmate, a teacher, a benefactor, but most of all, we will never forget you. You'll always live in our hearts. So I had the privilege of knowing Dr. Keo in a variety of capacities. He was one of the most multi-talented individuals that I have ever known. One of his most endearing characteristics was an inconspicuous disdain for formality. After my joining the faculty of Loma Linda University, 
He told me that he was only to be called Jeff now that we were colleagues. It was a command I found due to deep respect almost impossible to obey. He seemed to particularly enjoy watching the discomfort and stutter it occasionally caused me. Today, in light of the already emotional nature of this event, forgive me for referring to him most comfortably as Dr. Kao. Dr. Kao's chest of talents was immense. Within the limited context that I knew him, he served apparently effortlessly as CLIA director of a couple of hospital laboratories, beloved teacher of medical students and residents, chief of microbiology within the clinical laboratory, volunteer for community activities, hematopathologist, class sponsor, counselor, mentor, and most importantly, close friend. He cared about people, he loved people, and he got people. He understood in deep ways that few comprehend. He always gave just enough help, but never more, and always pushed those around him to do better, be better, and stretch farther than they imagined possible. His gentle and unexcitable nature were a stable force. There was no hint of arrogance nor condescension. I don't ever recall getting, seeing him get angry, as we've heard already, though there were plenty of ample opportunities However, he could be stirred to strong defense of those deemed undeservedly picked upon or passed over, and he even defended a few that some might consider to have been deservedly in trouble. My relationship with Dr. Kao goes back over 40 years. In 1982, the University Church started a Pathfinder Club. For those possibly less familiar with Pathfinders, it's basically a denominational version of the Scouts. The club was a hit. Apparently, every parent within 10 miles was ecstatic about the possibility of dropping their kid off Tuesday evenings for two to three hours. <laughs> Enrollment exceeded 100 by a very substantial margin. While parents were delighted with the prospect of the club for their kids, the enthusiasm for volunteering themselves to help, not so much. Dr. Kea was one of the generous adults who, in spite of what had to be an already packed schedule, showed up regularly every week to help in whatever capacity he was assigned. Although he seemed always in good humor, he was very encouraging to Francis Chan and me to hurry up and finish the requirements for our master guide so that we too could take on additional responsibility as dean counselors. He had a way of pitching it that made us actually feel privileged to be handed more work. At his core, Dr. Kao was a great educator. His greatness as a teacher was not due to his ability to lecture, which he could. It was not due to his knack for explaining complicated matters clearly, which he did. It was not due to his tireless work ethic, which he had. Dr. Kao's greatness as an educator was due to his ability to affirm. He was unbelievably affirming with an uncanny knack of knowing precisely when it mattered. I borrowed a master guide scarf from Art Walls, the director of the Pathfinder Club that Dr. Kao had served in, and I'll put it on in memory of Dr. Kao's affirmative nature as I close with a brief, hopefully not too emotional story that illustrates Dr. Kao's powers of perception and compassion. When I returned to Loma Linda as a medical student, Dr. Kao was one of my teachers. Whenever it was clear I was struggling or the test hadn't gone well, Dr. Kao would always seem to inadvertently bump into me in the hall and say, you can do this. You earned a master guide. This is easy. <laughs> when I told him I had chosen to pursue a career in hematopathology within pathology as he had, he told me, I knew you'd turn out all right when you got that master guide. It was a running joke. It was our thing. Not long after joining the faculty at Loma Linda, I was invited along with the rest of the hematopathology section of the department to a very formal dinner at a remarkably ritzy hotel in Hollywood. We arrived in full suits and ties. After our car was valeted, we were invited in to a dinner served on China with crystal and white linen. 
I felt very out of place and exceptionally conspicuous as the new kid in a really cheap suit. After all, I had just finished residency. Dinner was served and the speaker introduced. Just as the speaker began lecturing and the crowd quieted, I clumsily locked, knocked over my drink. It was a full glass. While I was trying my best to discreetly clean up what I could, hoping in spite of all evidence to the contrary that none of the crowd now staring at me had noticed, Dr. Kao leaned back in his chair and somewhat louder than a whisper, but a little bit softer than full speech, he said, you know, Paul, I'll bet we're the only two master guides in here. <laughs> he set the world at peace. It will never be the same without him. I'm on the shorter side. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone, friends and family of Dr. Kao. It's a privilege to speak to you today to celebrate such an awesome person. I've known Dr. Kao since 1998 when I was a student in his class. <laughs> and he was my professor, and he was definitely all the things that people have to feel good up earlier. And then in, um, he was actually the person who encouraged me to get into medicine, um, actually specifically pathology, because we had a post sophomore fellowship at that time. And um, I remember I was very excited about it. And um, he, I applied for the program and got in. And then I found out um, I was pregnant with our first child. And I told him, Dr. Kayla, I cannot do this fellowship. He said, why not? And I said, oh, because I'm going to have my first child. And he's oh, we've had tons of pregnant ladies. Don't worry about it, Heather. And that's just an example of how we treated everything. Everything was not a big deal, not a big situation. And he sort of walked, he's like, just walk it off. Not a big problem. So I'm here to talk about his um, work at the VA. He actually was one of the founding um, members of the VA. And I got to have him as a professor there and also as a colleague. And eventually he used to call me boss, which was sort of funny because <laughs> I was so tiny compared to him, and he was so impactful in my life. He um, was one of the founding members of the Department of Pathology at the VA. He worked there with the first chief, Dr. Bud Hurst, and he was a fellow new pathology with Dr. Daryl Eustace, who I think I saw here today. And this was back in the 70s. They set up the entire lab from the ground up which means they had carte blanche ability to deci decide which um, analyzers they wanted. So they picked out analyzers for chemistry, hematology, coagulation, blood bank, microbiology, and also anatomic pathology. And can you imagine as your very first job to be setting up an entire laboratory as a pathologist? Sort of um, a big uh, project, but he took it in stride. And um, he also did all of, a lot of the hiring interviewed all the different technologists who were coming on board, and um, wrote the policies for the whole laboratory. And I was like, wow, what an impressive thing for such a new pathologist to do. And actually, he was there when they opened the hospital in 1977. Day after Christmas, they had their first patients. And um, I think the first surgery was a cholecystectomy, so they successfully took care of that gallbladder. Um, it was a different time back then. Um, you know, we are used to such advanced um, technology in laboratory today. Um, but just imagine back then, they were just transitioning from mouth pipetting to using bulbs. So I do know some older technologists that have said, oh, I've gotten alco um, alcohol or acid in my mouth during my mouth pipetting. So things have changed quite a bit in the laboratory. And also, I've heard that in the um, laboratory at the VA at that time, there was smoking a lot in the hospital. I'm not sure about it in the lab, but in the hospital. So times have definitely changed. Um, the thing that hasn't changed is the way that peop, um, Dr. Kale treated people, um, both as a student, as a resident, as a colleague. He was just like um, what someone else men mentioned, took the time to talk with everyone and give them a helping hand. And um, he was the first chief of hematopathology at the VA. And um, because of him, I was counting in my just in, over the years in my mind, how many people have gone into hematopathology or pathology residents? There have been dozens. And that's a testament to how encouraging he was, 
And I, we used to love the rotation with him because the students would come, the medical students and the pathology residents, and he would treat you like a junior attending, basically like, you figure it out, you write it up, and then we'll talk about it. And sometimes it was like, no, wrong, mm -mm, no. But, <laughs> but at the end, you would always be put on the right um, path. Um, he would personally assist any time a resident had a physically challenging bone marrow, and I was thinking about a, um, a time when I just could not get a bone marrow. This is when we physically did them. And so I went back to the room and I said, Dr. Kayla, I cannot get this bone marrow. Can you help me? So I brought him back um, with me to the patient's room, and he's like, Heather, this is just about, it's like real estate. Location, location, location. <laughs> okay, so he went and made the incision in the right place, got it right on the first try, and I was like, oh my goodness, I feel so silly. Um, and he also said, and you have to put your back in it, which is hilarious, because he was like maybe a foot and a half taller than me, and he had a lot more torque than I do. So, but that's the way he was. He um, always made light of the situation, never made you feel bad, and always was teaching. And a lot of times he would actually pull out the skeleton after you've made a faux pas in the wrong location when you made the wrong incision, and he would bring, it, bring you back to his office and say, this is what I'm talking about, this particular area. And we kept that um, skeleton in our office for years and years um, just to keep on teaching the same way did he, that he did. And you know what? Even up until the work, weeks prior to him passing, he was still teaching our residents. He was still teaching our medical students because we have a multi-head scope in the pathology um, department in uh, the VA. And the students loved him. I don't know how many times he got um, rotation of the year by the pathology residents because they just loved him because he took the time out of his busy day to teach. And we are very appreciative of that. I can tell you that every time I pass, I pass by his office, there's a hole in my heart because we miss him. <laughs> Sorry, his impact is going to be in our department and our lives for many years to come. I think Dr. Kao would appreciate it if we all took a moment to stretch. I think the students, uh, the, those of you that are his students would uh, um, remember this constantly. So <clears throat> pretty much during the middle of every lecture, when people were feeling tired, he would uh, just take a break. And so if we can all just lean up in his memory, just take a reach for the sky, stretch up real tight. Okay. And put your arms way out to the side, and curl them in just a little bit. And you are hugging someone that loved and appreciated and adored Dr. Kao. Um, he was my, my teacher, my mentor, my friend. And there's one word that comes to mind when I think of Dr. Jeff Kao, it's that he was dedicated. Uniquely dedicated to the craft of teaching. <clears throat> but not just dedicated to the craft, but dedicated to the success, the contentment, the growth of his medical students. Um, by my estimation, he taught at least 6,000 students, that's probably a gross underestimate, and hundreds of uh, pathology residents over his incredible career, many of them in this room right now, many of them who were lucky enough to go on to be his colleague and friend, um, either in the pathology lab, in the hospital, or in the School of Medicine. What, a, what an incredible delight Jeff Kao was to each of us. The warmth and kindness he showed his students, his staff, to me, and really anyone he came into contact with is challenging to describe and I find impossible to fully characterize. So I thought it best to leave it to the words of his students. And so what follows are just a small snippet of the heaps of praise that his students have had for Dr. Kao over the years. Dr. Kao does more than go the extra mile for us. He treats us like colleagues and cares, us, cares for us like friends. I love it when he prays. 
Dr. Keo exceeds all expectations and boundaries when it comes to providing students with the material and resources that they need to exceed. I appreciate all the time and energy that he invests in creating these resources for the students. Dr. Keo unashamedly has his students' interests in mind. He is widely appreciated for the support, humor, and efforts that he puts into his class. Dr. Keo is such a kind and loving individual. I really appreciate his care and consideration for his students. Dr. Keo is a hilarious, fantastic, outstanding lecturer. Even when he was teaching material that was personally really difficult for me, he was able to present it in a simple way that made sense to me in class and was consistently able to keep the attention of the class during a lecture, a difficult thing to do. Dr. Keo is a very kind person that is always willing to stop and chat with you just because he cares. I really appreciate that. Dr. Keo is a very kind person. As all, uh, Dr. Dr. Keo seemed to genuinely care about us as physicians and as people, not just as students. Dr. Keo constantly shows his support for our learning by going far beyond what is required of him. He is the pinnacle of what teachers should be like. No other teacher is as personable and encouraging as Dr. Keo. When I struggle and when I feel inadequate, I can always count on him to lift my spirits. Dr. Keo is so, so sweet. He shows genuine care regarding our learning and truly wants the best for us. He goes to extra lengths to provide us with all the resources he can to ensure our success. He also prays for us, which is always much appreciated. I really feel cared for and loved by this guy. Dr. Keo is one of the kindest and most genuine men I have ever, ever come across. Dr. Keo gets it. He knows that people have different learning styles and does everything he can to fulfill those. He is widely appreciated for the support, humor, and effort that he puts into his class. Dr. Keo was truly interested in the students' learning and that he wanted and that he wanted what was best for us. He was gracious and patient when I would come to him to ask questions, and I appreciated his empathy for our lives as students. He shared some personal stories with us near the beginning of the year, that, and those really made an impression on me. I can really tell that Dr. Keo has students' best interests at heart, and he truly cares about our learning experience and becoming better doctors. He is consistently thoughtful and kind to students for very receptive to feedback and always there with encouragement and extra help. I can tell that he dedicates a lot of his personal energies into providing a better learning environment for his students. Dr. Keo is a wonderful teacher and a wonderful man. And I think I will end with my favorite one. It's very obvious Dr. Keo cares about us. I really appreciate how he prays for us, and how he tries to make things funny. I'm going to miss him and his jokes. <sighs> Me too. I'm going to miss his teaching and his mentoring, his love and his care, his jokes and his prayers, his warmth and his unending kindness. I'm going to miss him too. I think all of us are. Thank you, Donna, and the rest of the KO family for allowing me to briefly share with you about Jeff's involvement in the School of Medicine Alumni Association. Jeff was an incredible advocate for students. I first met Jeff, as many others did, in pathology class. You've already heard about what an amazing teacher he was, so I won't go into that. But I remember him clearly during the APC Gala my senior year of medical school, when the alumni hosts the seniors at the yearly banquet. He served as the MC, the Master of Ceremonies, and it was one of the funniest performances I had ever experienced. I don't remember much else from that night, but his humor and love of life stuck with me. Jeff served as president of the Alumni Association from 2005 to six, but his real love was students. 
He has been such an amazing advocate for the students of the School of Medicine. He served as chair of the Student Affairs Council from 1994 to 2001, and then he just remained a member of the council forever since. Carolyn Weeder, who served as administrative assistant and really the glue of the Student Affairs Council, worked with Jeff for many years, and she shared with me Jeff's belief about the importance of supporting students. He told her, the Alumni Association is continually looking for more ways to help students and to give them the vision of the great circle of life. Alumni helping students who then become alumni who help students. I have had the honor of chairing this council for the past few years and have seen Jeff putting this belief into action. One of the main functions of the council is to provide funding for student events, activities, after exam treats, yearbooks, and assisting those who find themselves in financial crises, unable to afford their rent or food. Whenever a student brought up an item for funding and the budget wasn't there to support that, Jeff would always raise his hand and make a motion to support the student's request anyway. He would say, I think we can provide that. And then he would often donate the funds himself. Those motions always passed. I think he would have rather gone hungry himself than think of a student who couldn't afford their next meal. Jeff was kind, he was caring, and he was incredibly generous. He was truly one of Loma Linda's treasures. The Alumni Association, the students it serves, and I will miss him terribly. And this may not be the appropriate place to say this, but I would be remiss in my duty as Student Affairs Council Chair if I didn't say that Jeff would like you to donate to the student fund. Thank you. Well, I think after hearing all of the stories, we can certainly realize that Dr. Jeff Kao, um, as a teacher, affected people's minds, but more importantly, touched their hearts. And as the dean of the School of Medicine and looking at the number of contributions people make, it's always incredibly fascinating to see the difference that a life can make. Uh, Dr. Kao graduated from the School of Medicine, as many of you know, in 1971, and returned um, fairly soon, and has taught pathology for all of those years since. Uh, he served as director of the pathology course for a number of years, a number of decades, actually. And I think that uh, many of you here remember the amazing effort that he went, not just to teach you the material, to but to touch your heart and recognize this is something that you could do. At the national level, uh, Jeff was involved in uh, writing questions for the national boards in pathology and did a number of really remarkable things. He's been recognized by the university, by the school, by the Alumni Association with many awards, and as Teacher of the Year on, on numerous occasions. Uh, a couple of things that he did uh, that I think are particularly memorable is he served on our admissions committee for a number of years. He interviewed hundreds and thousands of students that were trying to get into the School of Medicine. And every student that he interviewed, he would come and present them to the committee. And every student he would finish and he'd say, this is a must have student. So I, it always kind of cracked me up because I always wondered I wouldn't have been want, wanted to have been the, the one student in the history that wasn't a must-have student. Um, but it uh, really showed the way he connected and the way he invested in the success of the students around him. Uh, Gina just mentioned the number of years that he served on the Student Affairs Council for the Alumni Association. And there really are a lot of different things that that council does. They do things like provide the welcome picnic when students start school. They do an ice cream feed at the annual Pine Springs retreat. And they do a lot, a lot of support around students who are stressed and studying for tests. And I think he really is best remembered for the kindness and generosity and 
both compassion and mercy that he showed uh, to students who might have been stressed or worried whether they could do something. Um, but the one thing he always said as they were bringing, whether the treats or whatever the Alumni Association Student Council brought, is he'd say, we're bringing this to you because we love you. And that showed you didn't, he didn't just touch their minds, he touched their hearts. And so I would say from the School of Medicine to um, all of your family here and all of Jeff's colleagues here that we loved him back. And we're really grateful for the numerous contributions he made. Dear Donna, I have a few words also on behalf of Aafje for you and for all who are present here today, for all for whom Jeff was either a father, a grandfather, an uncle, a colleague, a friend, or a brother in the faith. I have only known Jeff for a limited number of years. Donna, you introduced Jeff to me as your special friend. But it was soon clear to me that he was someone you had begun to care about a lot beyond just friendship. I remember as the day of yesterday that we discussed your future plans and that when you hesitated, I encouraged you to bond your lives together. I was honored when you and Jeff asked me to come to the United States to officiate at your wedding and to declare you husband and wife. I have kept the text of the homily that I spoke at the wedding ceremony. I read it through once more before I recorded these few words. I spoke in that homily of marriage in terms of commitment. Donna, no one who knew you and Jeff can ever have had any doubt about your mutual commitment. But in your solemn vow, by which you took Jeff as your husband, you said that it was to ho have and to hold, to love and to cherish, until we are parted by death. That moment of being parted by death came earlier than you and Jeff had hoped for. But I want to repeat what I said in the homily now some five years ago. Time is not just measured in duration. But first of all, it is measured in its degree of it intensity and in its quality. Quality goes also here beyond quantity. Five years of loving care and closeness has far greater value than being 25 years in an unsatisfactory relationship. Saying this is not some form of cheap consolation, but it is something that I truly believe. Donna, you had five years together, but they were good years. I hope, Donna, that in your grief, gratefulness for what you had these past years will reign over despondency and that your love for Jeff will carry you through in the emptiness of the coming time. You had something special that gave your life a richness that will remain. And for all of you today in this church, in whatever way you were connected with Jeff, may the memory of this truly good man remain an inspiration. May God bless you as he blessed Jeff with so many a 
precious gifts and with a personality that made him such a loving and lovable person. And may God bless you, Donna, in a special way as you continue without Jeff beside you, but with him in your heart. God bless you. Alexa, this is my daughter Alexa, I'm Donna, uh, this is my support animal, as they would say. <laughs> there have been so many interesting uh, tales about Jeff, uh, I, I, I'm going to read what I, what I wrote, but uh, one of my favorite stories I'll just tell you. Jeff told me, well, two things about his height that people have. One was that when he came here to work with Brian Bull, Brian was so happy. And he said, and he told Jeff how glad he was that finally there was someone on this campus that Monty Murdoch had to look up to. <laughs> Monty was Brian's cousin. The other story about Jeff's height uh, was the, he told me he was standing at the elevators shortly after the new hospital, now the old hospital, opened and the, uh, the doors opened and there was a very tiny Hispanic lady standing there. And she looked up and up and up and she said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and Jeff said, no. <laughs> He's a friend of mine. <laughs> okay. As you will conclude from what you've heard from other people today, Jeff K.O. was a man who knew how to love and care for people. In particular, and I think I say this for Dita as well as myself, he was a man who knew how to love and care for a woman, a wife. Many members of this church, female members, and I was one of them, remember how gently he lifted Dita from wheelchair to pew and back every week until she became too frail to attend services. I told him once that it was the memory of that scene that made me decide to say yes to his proposal of marriage. When we said our wedding vows, Jeff pledged not just to love and to cherish, but to cherish and cherish and cherish. And so he did. He cherished with the first cup of coffee he brought me every morning. Although I think that was partly so that I couldn't legitimately uh, complain about the amazing amounts of Diet Coke he consumed throughout the day. He cherished with fresh flowers every Friday afternoon. He cherished with little bearded, bespectacled, happy face Jeff was here notes that I would find in the kitchen when he <coughs> stopped by on his way to the lab in Beaumont. He cherished when we walked together listening to Peter Robinson and Uncommon Knowledge podcasts. And he cherished by cheerfully eating anything I cooked, anything, even the slightly overdone, scorched stuff. He cherished when we read books and phones together in bed at night. And he cherished while reciting Psalm 23 as we fell asleep, both of us knowing that we rested at the edge of the Valley of Shadow. If anyone wonders what marriage can be like for two older lovers, take it from me, it can be just like it is for young lovers. Wonderful. 
Jeff and I enjoyed watching old Hollywood movies on his iPad, and so with apologies to Oscar Hammerstein, in closing, I borrow a few lines from the 1957 version of The King and I. In marriage, as in all aspects of his life, Jeffrey Kao was brave and faithful and true. And thus, all of my memories are happy tonight because I've been in love with you. Thank you, Jeffrey Donnell Kao. Thank you, thank you, thank you for five of the best years of our lives. Goodbye, Jeff. Okay, this one's for Gabby.
melts like a lemon drops high above the chimney top. That's where you find me, oh, somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, and the dream that you did to.
I have been thinking about the Old Testament and then repeated in the New Testament standard for truthful testimony being that at least two to three witnesses say the same thing. I've been looking at my notes thinking we were all reading off the same page, but then realizing we were all simply reading the same life. I've been thinking the last few days trying to remember where it was that I first met Jeff Kao. We've had the wonderful privilege of living and working in this community for something over 36 years now. And so a Loma Linda icon like Jeff Kao is part of the landscape. I cannot remember. It's just, Donna, as though Jeff was always there. But there are things I definitely do remember. I remember coming to join the pastoral team here at the University Church and being told by my colleagues that we have tried, they said, to make this a first name basis church. That for all the value that Dr. Smith and Dr. Jones and Dr. Anderson has on either end of the campus, here we want everything to be the same. So here we're on a first name basis. I partially made that transition. There were some that I just still can't do it. Having grown up in Latin America and in the south of this country, where it's yes sir, no ma'am, si senor, uh, that was just a bridge too far at times. But thinking about it, I hope this is in no way disrespectful, I always knew him as Jeff. And I think that speaks to the kind of person that your father, your brother, grandfather, husband, was. It's been said that he was a gentle giant, and I think that's exactly the way I experienced him. Working with him here at the church in different capacities, he is head elder, as one of the elders, as a deacon, as a regular supporter and volunteer of our young adult ministry. I got to know him in a variety of different ways. And I discovered fairly early on that if I didn't have a pew between me and Jeff, meaning I was here and he was there, and even at times then, he would sweep me up to, into a big bear hug and lift me off the ground, crushing the life, if not the breath, out of me. But that's just who he was. It's why he was so deeply loved by students, by faculty, no doubt by many around the campus and its staff and its church membership. And so it's an honor to say a few words as we remember him today. I asked you, Donna, about a, a passage of scripture, what might be appropriate at a time like this, and I was, I was very thrilled, actually, to hear you say 2 Timothy 4 that has been quoted by a couple of people previous to now. But it's what you said about the passage that set me to thinking. Because you said that passage is so Jeff Kale. And so as I sat down this past week, reading and rereading the passage, trying to understand the, pot, the apostle who wrote it and the person about whom it could be said that passage is so Jeff Kale, I tried to understand both. First, the passage. It has to have just a brief word of background. Paul, we believe, at the writing of this, his last missive, was writing to his young son in the faith, Timothy. 
As he was writing, he knew that the sands in the hourglass of his life were running low. There wasn't much time left. This could be, and as it turned out to be, was his final letter. And so as that quill pen scratched onto the parchment these words that have become immortal, Paul was writing about himself. But I came to understand that he was writing also maybe about Jeff. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. As I was reading this passage, it struck me that there are three things that virtually emanate out of the passage. The passage throbs with them about Paul and maybe about Jeff. The first is calling. As you read this passage, you have a deep sense of Paul's calling in life. The calling that has formed everything that he has done. The calling that he received from Jesus himself on the road to Damascus and the calling that never ceased to compel him forward. It's the way he begins epistle after epistle. It's the second word in many, if not most, of his epistles, at least in the English translations. Paul called to be an apostle. Paul called by God. Paul called. That sense of calling never left him. So much so that when we, when we read it here, we recognize that this is echoing other statements that he has made. Not only those statements that begin so many of his epistles, Paul called, but also statements like the ones he wrote to the friends of his in the church in Philippi when he said, I forget everything else, laying it all aside, and press on toward the mark for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That sense of calling was deep, and it emanated outward, affecting everybody with whom he came into contact and continuing to influence, quite literally, human history 2,000 years later. Calling, it is there. Just like you sensed it once you were around Jeff for a period of time, I don't know. I wished this past week that I had asked him specifically. I don't know how he might have answered, Jeff, what is your calling? Would he have said, my calling is to continue the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus? Might he have said, my calling is to influence student lives in a Godward direction? Would he have said, I want to leave footprints that others can follow so that they might know how they can be the best physician, the best pathologist, the best mentor to others. Would he have said, as you so well said, Donna, my calling is to love, to love with humility and to love with faithfulness. I'm not sure what he would have said, but you couldn't be around him long without knowing that calling wasn't core to who he was. Maybe that's, Donna, why you said that passage is so Jeff Kao. The second reality that emerges from Paul's passage is completion. Completion. I have fought. I have run. I have kept. 
he is able to stand there near the finish line of his life and say, I have completed the task for which God placed his hand on me. Though this was millennia before Eric Erickson, we can imagine that he finishes with a sense of integrity and certainly not of despair. Paul's completion was one in which he followed the blood-stained footprints of Jesus, knowing from Jesus' life that your life is measured not by your wealth, not by your education, not by its length, but by your faithfulness to be able to come to the end and say, I have kept, I have run, I have finished. Completion. I've had conversations with Jeff over the years, including ones in more recent times, that have always struck me with a sense of wholeness, a sense of ease with life, a sense of being strangely unimpressed with who he was. It seemed like everybody else was impressed except him. That's remarkable. What a way to complete your journey. When Jesus told parables about the coming, about his coming, and about that day where we would stand before God, he finished them at times with words like, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what it means to truly complete your life's journey. I was reminded of that some years ago watching an interview late in his life of the Reverend Billy Graham. The interviewer was not, to my knowledge, a person of faith, but asked very probing and sensitive questions. Toward the end of the interview, the question was, what, what will make it worthwhile to you? What will give it all meaning, something along those lines? To which Graham replied, to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. That will make it all worthwhile. Well, Paul, in his own unique way, is writing about that in this passage. It's as though he hears echoes from the parables of Jesus, from the teaching of Jesus, and from the spirit in his own heart and life of those words, well done. Maybe that's why Donna said this passage is so Jeff Kao. Because everything in me says the day will come when Jesus will say to Jeff, well done, Jeff, well done. But it's not just calling or completion. The third reality that emerges to me from the passage is culmination. Because even when he completes, that's really not the actual culmination of the journey. The culmination for the journey for Paul comes as he reflects on the fact that he has run and he has fought and he has kept. Then he says, now there is, or in some versions, therefore, our Bible teachers always told us when you see the word therefore, you've got to ask what it's there for. Well, the reason it's there for is because of that, because I've run and I've completed and I've kept, therefore, the Lord will award to me on that day the gift, the crown, the joy of life. Different writers have treated that event in different ways in the New Testament. Peter called it the blessed hope. Luke, at the beginning of his set second volume, simply says, as Jesus went, so he will return. John treats it by saying that Jesus huddled with his disciples and says, said, don't let your hearts be troubled. I will come again. But here, Paul treats it by saying, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, 
will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all those also who have loved and longed for his appearing. That's the true culmination. So I wonder, Donna, I didn't ask you purposely why it was that this passage was so Jeff Kao. I know why it's so Pauline, and I think that spills over onto Jeff and maybe a few others. Calling and completion and culmination, that sense of a life well lived, a Lord well served, a faith well held. We come to a moment like this with sorrow. And we should. It's a profound loss. But we also come to a moment like this with hope. Because the hope is real, and the hope is grand, and the hope is for Paul, and the hope is for Jeff, and the hope is for all who long for the appearing of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Lord, Father of us all, Thank you for inviting us to call you Father. Indeed, if you are our Father, that makes us your children and we are family. We are part of each other. And at a time like this, by the connections you provide, what touches one of us touches all of us. Our hearts hurt together at the loss of your beloved son, Jeff Kao. But you have not lost him. He is safe and secure in your heart, your hands. Thank you for giving us Dr. Jeff, husband, father, grandfather, doctor and teacher of doctors, and yes, dear, dear friend, we are all better for having had him in our lives. So right now, Lord, we pray that we may seek to know you and emulate the qualities that made Jeff the dear and faithful friend he was. And in just the way you do things, as Dr. Jeff, in his own way, exhibited the hope of your kingdom, please fill all our hearts with hope that we may look forward to that wonderful reunion when you put the whole K.O. family and all families back together again. Thank you for dispatching a special retinue of angels to be with this dear family. Dear Donna, each person that Dr. Kao had as a family, until you call him to a new life of joy and pleasure and health forevermore. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, life giver, returning Lord. Amen. Yes, thank you all for being here. Please remain where you are as Chemo blesses us with the postlude. And then following the postlude, just stay a little more until Pastor Darrell can come over and Donna can take his arm and lead the family over to the fellowship hall. And in due course, you may get up and go and greet the family there. Thank you for being here.